All right. Recording in progress, Zoom says. So yay, and you are already in the house. Look at that. Uh, I see people streaming through the door, uh, through the gate of the garden center as we get ready to sit back and relax together. So welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm just opening my chat window so that I can tell uh, and read and uh, let me just make it available so that you can chat with everyone and I can chat with everyone and I think we've got it going there. Okay, so if you haven't been with me before, um, this is what we do. We spend a couple of minutes, you know, making sure that everybody's in the room, getting into the right place. Then I will give, uh, present the presentation that I've done for you tonight. Uh, and after that, I take your questions in chat. And so Robert, welcome from Florida. We, you know, we tend to have Cape Codders from all over <laughs> in these happy hours and you are all welcome. If you have never been to a Hyannis Country Garden happy hour with me in the past, type it in chat and chat is the little speech uh, bubble in the bottom of your screen and you can type it in there. And Noreen and Zach, good to see you back. Um, it's, it's always my pleasure to see familiar names when I look at the registrations. And it is also my pleasure to see unfamiliar names. We've got somebody joining us from Mexico tonight. Oh my goodness, you people in war are in warm places. And let me tell you, if you were not on Cape last week, you didn't miss a thing because those people who have been on Cape in the past week know that until today, it was pretty dismal. It was cold and damp and cold and damp. So Carol Ann, your first time, I'm so glad that you're here. And Cheryl, first time new to the Cape, welcome. Um, I always love knowing that, you know, when we have newbies in the house and we also, uh, I also love knowing, you know, that you are, are back again and you have enjoyed it in the past. Now, if you have been to Country Garden, you recognize uh, I've got the nursery behind me. It is not the nursery as it is looking today, unfortunately, but it is the nursery as it will be looking probably in three or four weeks. It's amazing the transformation that happens between the middle of March and the middle of April. And so it's all wonderful and um, I can't wait. I can't wait for spring. So welcome all the old timers and the new timers. I always ask anybody who is interested to let me know what's in your glass. I'll tell you what's in my glass is Spindrift um, grapefruit soda <laughs> because I can't drink and Zoom in terms of alcohol, but I will have a cocktail later. So, um, but it doesn't matter what is in your glass. What matters is that we are here together, okay? taking a breath, concentrating on something pleasant and life affirming, which is plants and gardens, all right? So escape with me now um, to beauty and purpose and joy, and we're gonna have a great hour together. After the presentation, I take your questions in chat, all right? So um, whatever is on your mind, whether it has to do with what I've been talking about or not, no problem at all. We will take as many questions as we can fit by six o'clock. Six o'clock, then it's time to go to dinner. But um, if I haven't answered all the questions that are typed in chat, I save the chat and then I do a special Hyannis Country Garden blog post where I answer those questions in the blog. All right. So all of your beverages sound delicious <laughs> and um, I say, let's sit back, let's enjoy and talk a little bit about saving time in the garden. So let me share my screen. Let me click this presentation. Let me play the slideshow. And there we are, we're doing it. Off and running, time savers, happy hour um, here at Hyannis Country Garden tonight. You know, this is gonna be assorted tips for saving time 
in your yard and garden, plus of course your questions answered at the end. And we're gonna talk a little bit about style and different styles that save time. We're gonna talk about approaches to your yard and your garden and how you can save time there. We're gonna talk about some good tools and how the right tool saves you time. Now, listen, don't raise your hands, okay? Cause I don't answer raised hands uh, while I'm speaking. I answer all the questions typed in chat. And by the way, if you wanna remember a picture, you know, I don't mind you take, take your uh, cell phone and take a picture or take a screenshot of what's on, on the screen, okay? For you to remember. And then I'll come back to chat afterwards and I'll answer your questions there. So uh, we're gonna talk about practices in the garden. And let's start out by talking about the wisdom of planting ground covers around your shrubs. Because when you've got a ground cover there, less weeding and less mulching. Instant time saver, right? Okay. So why do we see gardens that have these bare mulched areas underneath, right? These are areas where there could be other things planted for this particular homeowner. I suggested hosta, which is what this um, photo was all about. But um, any ground cover that covers the ground outcompetes weeds, and that's an area you don't have to put down mulch. Saves a lot of time. Now, here's one of my favorites. This is Epimedium. This is a ground cover for shade or part shade. It's drought tolerant. Flowers in the spring when the daffodils do, as you can see here. Um, but it's not the flowers you plant it for. The flowers are fine but you plant it for the sweet heart-shaped leaves and the fact that it is weed smothering once it gets going. That is the goal. You also don't want, however, a ground cover that takes over your entire yard or your life like the ivy, Baltic ivy does. So I'm focusing on ground covers here that don't become a long-term problem. Geranium macrorhizum. You know, I had to memorize the spelling of the species name because I recommend it so much and I'm not a good speller. So I had to memorize this one and, and commit it to my mind because this is a great plant. The bunnies don't eat it. The deer don't eat it. It is drought tolerant in shade. It has that sweet little pink flower, minty fragrance foliage, and the weeds don't stand a chance when you get this going. So this is a good one. And again, you can take a screenshot if you want to remember the name. And also this is being recorded. And we put the recordings up on the Hyannis Country Garden events page, you know, a couple of days after the program. And it's also on Facebook Live. So hi, Facebook people, uh, welcome. And uh, you can watch the recording then if you want to come back and, and look at a name. Okay, now the hostas, again, it's a weed smothering plant and there are many low ones that make good ground covers. People tend not to think of them as ground covers because many of them are large, but they do the job, right? They do the job where those hostas are, you don't have to weed and you don't have to mulch. Ladies mantle is a pretty good ground cover because it self seeds. And so once you let it go and it kind of fills in, particularly in part shade, this is a nice ground cover plant. Um, it's not quite as low maintenance, I would say, as the epimedium or the uh, geranium macrorhizum or the hosta, just because you may want to deadhead this after it finishes flowering to improve the appearance or you can let it just seed and, and, and be fine as well. Now, listen, in perennial gardens, let's talk about how to save time in perennial gardens because a perennial garden is a lot of work, right? We love perennials. I love perennials because they're different from May to June to July to August to September, right? So it's a kaleidoscope of color. That's why you love perennials, but they can be a lot of work. So first of all, in a perennial garden, pack those plants in because the closer those plants are growing together, you plant heavy, right? You have fewer weeds and less mulching. 
because the perennials are filling the garden. And let your plants touch, that's okay, right? So getting those perennials really packed in there is actually a key to less work as long as you're planting the right plants. Because there are some perennials like this hardy hibiscus that are very low maintenance and easy, and some perennials that are not so much. Use perennials that don't need staking, deadheading, or frequent dividing. There are some perennials that I will not have in my garden because they are so high maintenance. And here's a little tip, pass along plants often are pass along problems. Just beware, okay? Because oftentimes the plants you see in plant sales in the spring, there's a reason they have it to give away. <laughs> now, you know, there are some plants like this upright clematis. It's a lovely short, it's not a binding clematis, it's an upright clematis, but you have to stake it. You have to support it. So that takes more time because you have to get out there and put up that support before it falls over and gets ruined. So you have to spend that time in advance, right? Knowing the right moment to get that support in there. So this is not a time-saving plant. Iris, you know, this is a, what I call a can this marriage be saved plant for my husband and myself because he loves Iris and I, I have no use for them. <laughs> they're beautiful when they're in bloom, but they need deadheading. They need fairly frequent dividing. This is not a planted and forget it perennial. And of course, the delphiniums. These are labeled as perennials, but if you get them back a second year, it's a gift from God. <laughs> These plants want to be living in Seattle or the UK, right? And the um, some of the uh, Moonbeam Coreopsis, again, a short-lived plant. So check into which perennials are less maintenance and are more long-lived and are attractive before and after they bloom. And those plants will save you time. Don't use perennials that are prone to diseases. I love hollyhocks. Do I grow them in my garden? No because it's almost impossible to have a hollyhock on Cape Cod that doesn't have hollyhock rust. And it ends up looking terrible. We have very humid soil here. These are plants that are prone to rust in this area, really hard to grow them. So look for plants that don't get diseases. You know, there are monardas that are way prone to powdery mildew. And then there are Menardas that are not. Jacob Klein uh, is one that is not prone to powdery mildew. So, you know, to save time, don't plant plants that are prone to diseases because either you have to cut them out early or you have to try and spray them. So, you know, who needs that? Look for plants that have no disease problems. Now, knowing that perennials are high maintenance plants, if you have too large of a perennial bed, don't be afraid to cut it back to save time, right? Now this is a gorgeous garden, a professionally designed, planted and maintained garden on Martha's Vineyard, uh, but uh, that contains both perennials and some annuals. It is beautiful, but I guarantee you that those professionals are probably in this garden at least once a week for half a day, if not longer, for the deadheading and the you know weeding and the planting of the, of the annuals and, and all of that. So this would not be a garden to plant if you wanna save time, right? Maybe half the size uh, would be a good idea. This is a lovely garden I visited, um, might even be your garden, I don't know. But if, if the homeowner decided that this was too much of a perennial garden, they wanted to save time, this garden could be edited back here and just have a strip along the fence rather than having it come out into the yard. So it's perfectly all right to say to a you know garden, 
this has been great. You've been a lot of fun. I don't have the time for you anymore. And then reduce the size, restore some lawn, right? I know there's a big, let's get rid of the lawn movement, but lawn can be very low maintenance if you just let plants grow in there that grow in there and mow it once a week or every other week and you're done. So mixed shrub borders are also less work than a perennial garden. So look for ways you can put shrubs together and let your plants touch each other. You know, another way that people use time needlessly in a garden is trying to keep the plants away from each other. This is not how nature grows plants. Look at any conservation area. They're all in there duking it out, right? <laughs> Looking for their opportunity to have sunshine. Um, and you can save a lot of time by not thinking that your plants need to have space in between them. Now, if you do think that an area is too crowded, if it visually is bothering you, you could remove every other plant. That would be a plan that would then save you time. And you let the plants that you've decided to have stay you let them just continue to be as big as they wanted. If this planting bothered me, this is at my house, and, and it doesn't bother me, but if it did bother me, I could take out this um, dwarf blue jay white pine here and then just let the little quick fire and the firelight hydrangea and the um, sweet cherry tea physocarpus, I could just let them stay if I decided that I didn't like the fact that these plants were growing in together. But I like how that looks. I, it, to me, is a rich tapestry in the garden. And again, time saving. Another way that you can save time in the garden is to embrace a wilder look. And a lot of people are embracing that wild child style at this point not only because it is time saving, but because it supports wildlife and particularly insects. And so having a garden like this, that is planted with a lot of native plants, I see goldenrod and milkweed and veronicastrum and some, some native grasses in there. Looks like maybe there was some monarda and rudbeckia, black-eyed Susans. So a lot of native plants put in field style, right? Where again, the plants, you're, this, this homeowner is not trying to control these plants. The homeowner is letting the plants duke it out <laughs> and decide, you know, which plant now maybe eventually this might be mostly goldenrod, I don't know. Or eventually it might be mostly milkweed. But the homeowner is taking that relaxed attitude here which saves them time. Ah, here's another example of that. Um, this one looks a little dry, a little parched, but again, it's a more wild style and the plant that rules the day, the what looks like maybe Rebecca at Black Eyed Susan's here, it's allowed to rule the day. Um, and here again, a Rebecca and some grasses and maybe some, a little bit of uh, a Rigeron. So a wild garden, beautiful, but you have to embrace that style. So you decide if this is your cup of tea or not. Formal gardens, this is a beautiful formal garden, isn't it? Mm. But they take a lot of time to maintain, all right? All of that clipping and the planting and the shaping and all of that, the replacing when something dies uh, takes a lot of time to maintain. Now you might want to, on your property, leave some areas for nature to mulch, right? Nature does a good job of mulching with uh, particularly in this area, oak leaves and pine needles. So for a long time, it has been the practice for people to rake up their oak leaves and rake up their pine needles. Maybe you don't have to do that over your entire property. Maybe you want to leave those oak leaves and those pine needles in certain areas. And then in other areas, 
you may mulch with something else, right? But you let nature take care of some areas. And by the way, oak leaves and pine needles do not make soil acidic. That is an old myth. We need to kill that one as soon as possible. Um, and uh, they are like any other organic matter that decomposes from the top down, they keep the soil healthy. And that's another reason to mulch, of course. A reason to mulch is to keep the weeds away, but also to keep the soil healthy. Now, when you do put down mulch, do it before mid-May to prevent the weed seeds from sprouting because that will save you time. A lot of seeds sprout on the Cape from the middle of May um, to the beginning of June. And it all has to do with the soil temperature warming up. So if you want to prevent those from appearing, put down your mulches, decide what you want to use. This is the mulch display that uh, Chris Dunlap made at Hyannis Country Garden, shows you what they look like. And the difference between these is basically a matter of what you want to see. Although the black and the red are dyed, okay? Those are not natural colors. So just know that, all right? Um, so if it matters to you that they are color enhanced, <laughs> you might wanna choose one of the other. Uh, but other than that, you know, this mix that you see here of fine pieces and bigger pieces, that's a good mulch. Because if it was all really fine, that would make a thicker, more impenetrable barrier on the surface of your soil, which you don't want. You want that mix of some big pieces and some little pieces, right? So that you have good air flow in the soil because air is really important to soil and you have good water flow as well. Um, so, and to save time, don't use landscape fabric underneath it because you'll have to spend time ripping it out eventually. So now let's talk a little bit about seed starting because it's seed starting time. My peppers are up. My um, cardoon has germinated. And I think this weekend I'm going to start my tomato seeds. Well, if you start your seeds in four inch pots or maybe slightly smaller pots, but not in tiny cells, or not in, certainly not in eggshells, that's a disaster. Um, then you save time because you don't have to transplant them. I've started my seeds in cow pots and they're about four inches across. Um, and I like these because they are a local product uh, from Connecticut. They are a product designed to use cow poop, which is a problem, you know, uh, when particularly in places where cows are, are raised for dairy products. And so it's it's great, it's peat free, uh, it's a renewable resource, and I have great success with these in my garden. So I'm using cow pots and I'm using the bigger ones, or I'm using recycled pots. This is my seed starting shed. And these are all pots that I've recycled from either things that I purchased or pots that have been um, left at Country Garden in their recycling area and I will recycle them but I see, you can see that they're all larger pots. They're not tiny little cells. And the reason is it saves me time. And I put one or two seeds per pot. And if two plants come up, yes, I sacrifice one of them. <laughs> I will pull up one of them uh, because you want one plant per pot. And again, if you only put one seed per pot, that saves you time and you don't have to sacrifice anything. Um, so one seed per pot. And if, if that one seed doesn't germinate in 10 days, you can tuck another seed in there and use the same soil and start with another seed. So that can be time saving at this time of year. Now you don't wanna start all your vegetables inside. Uh, many of our customers think that because they can come into Country Garden at the end of May and buy uh, melon plants and cucumber plants and zucchini plants, right, and bean plants, that those should be started in advance. 
Um, actually, you can certainly come in, you're welcome to come in and buy those plants if you don't want to start them from seed. But if you have seed, don't start those things I just mentioned inside. Those are seeds that get put directly in the soil toward the end of May. Again, that saves you time because if you're starting the seeds that are on this list inside, first of all, they're gonna get big very quickly and you're not going to be able to plant them outside yet. And so then you're going to have to put them in larger pots and figure out how to give them more light. And it's going to be a waste of your time. Whereas if you put these seeds directly into the garden, time-saving, they will germinate and grow there. And the, the plants that love heat, like the beans and the basil and the squash and the uh, those plants, the seeds should go at the end of May. You can plant the chard seeds and your lettuce seeds and the root crops, your turnips and your carrots and your beets. You can plant those more toward the beginning or middle of May. And forget about planting peas on St. Patrick's Day on Cape Cod. It, it's not a good idea. <laughs> it's too cold. The, the soil here is too cold in March for seeds to germinate. And you don't wanna start your annual seeds too early either because they grow quickly. So um, in terms of annual seeds, zinnias and cosmos and those sort of thing, start them toward the end of April or early May and you'll be in good shape because they germinate in about 10 minutes and within three weeks, they're ready to go into the garden. All right. So let's talk about some tools that are time savers, because this is huge. And the main one are pruning tools. If you have an old, dull set of uh, pruners, or if you have a, an anvil pruner that smashes the stem rather than slicing through the stem, like these bypass pruners, it's going to take you three times longer to prune your plants, guaranteed. If you have sharp, high quality tools and uh, the bypass pruners, bypass loppers, right? That is time saving. When it comes to pruning equipment, you get what you pay for. And if you wanna save time, go for the, the high price item, right? Felco pruners and silky saws. They are sharp. They are, you know, you can, instead of going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth for 10 minutes trying to saw off a branch with a silky saw, you can do three or four pushes and you've got that branch removed because it is so sharp. So good pruning equipment is a big time saver. Now I am crazy for these shovels. If you've heard me on the radio um, raving about these, these are time savers because they go into the ground and into plants that you need to dig up or divide so much more easily. Um, these were invented by a guy who is, I think in his seventies or his eighties even, who had had numerous joint replacements, knees and hips, and who no longer had the strength to shove that shovel into the ground. And so he carved them out so that they are more of a, a sharp spade. And boy, do these make a difference. I don't use any of my old shovels anymore. I look around for the spearhead spade and use that. Uh, we will be getting more spearhead spades in at Hyannis Country Garden toward the end of the month. That order is coming in. You can get the short one, like the blue one there on the left, or a long handle, like the one on the right. And if you do any amount of perennial gardening, these are great tools. If you need to dig up uh, an ornamental grass, this is a great tool. If you have to do any dividing this spring, this will save you a lot of time. Let's talk about time saving in the vegetable garden a little bit, all right? Um, first of all, one to two inches of mulch keeps weeds away. Uh, we sell mainly mulch, which is a hay mulch at Country Garden, uh, the chopped up hay, and that's a good mulch. 
You can use chopped up leaves like you see in this garden. This is chopped up oak leaves and pine needles. Yes, great, great mulch for the vegetable garden. Uh, we offer pine needles, uh, straight pine needles that are very attractive and a great mulch in a vegetable garden. So putting that down early um, saves you time later on uh, in the garden. And believe it or not, harvesting regularly will save you time because once vegetables get too large, <laughs> it's a problem, all right? And so going out there and picking the zucchini when it's small, right? And the cucumbers and the eggplants uh, and the tomatoes, go out there every evening at five o'clock and say, what's for dinner? And pick them when they're young. First of all, they're more flavorful when they're young, right? There's a reason that chefs in fancy schmancy restaurants in New York City buy baby zucchinis because they're delicious, right? They're, they're so flavorful and wonderful. Um, you can have that on your own fancy schmancy plate uh, in the summertime by planting the squash and harvesting them. Go out there every day and pick some of those zucchini. Water with a sprinkler or soaker hose, not by hand. Hand watering takes longer. You, you set up a sprinkler, you put it on a timer, and you let it go until your garden gets a good deep soaking, and you don't have to stay out there. I don't understand why people continue to insist on hand watering vegetable gardens. Now, sometimes people say to me, oh, but if you're using a sprinkler, you're watering from the top and the foliage gets wet. Well, guess what happens when it rains? <laughs> the foliage gets wet, right? So do it in the morning if you can, all right? But know that nature waters from the top. There is no reason that you can't. You want to water deeply, but less often. You certainly wouldn't want that water raining down on your vegetables every morning, no. But once a week, no problem. All right, this is my vegetable garden. We water with a back and forth sprinkler. It is on a timer. We water that garden for three hours once a week. Done. And I don't have to stand out there with a the watering lawn. You can also use soaker hoses if you like soaker hoses by all means, but again, longer, less often. Let's talk about saving time with annuals. I love annuals, okay? And I plant a lot of them. Yes, I have to plant them every year, but you know what? They flower all summer and they make me happy. <laughs> so the, I, I plant these with purpose and the purpose is to making me happy. And by the way, making the bees and the butterflies happy too. And some annuals don't need to be clipped. Um, this is Kufia vermilionaire. You can see that hummingbird on a loop there working this plant. You like hummingbirds, you must have this plant. It was a proven winner's plant, but I can put this in a container and I don't touch it all summer long. I don't prune it, I don't deadhead it, I don't touch it, it keeps on producing and it makes my hummers happy and it makes me happy as well. Now annuals sold in six packs usually need de deadheading, all right? And that's because they are grown from seed and seed plants they're on a freight train to making more seed. That's every plant's mission on this planet is to push its genetics into the future. But if you want your annuals to be flowering all summer, you need to discourage the seed production so that it makes more flowers. That's why annuals that are sold in the six packs usually need to be deadheaded in order to keep them flowering with two notable exceptions. This is a profusion zinnia. We sell profusion zinnias in six packs as well as in pots, and they don't need deadheading. Yay! Um, so that's a time-saving plant. They don't need pinching. They don't need you know anything. You put them in the garden, and they are off and running. And also wax begonias don't need deadheading. So those come in six packs as well. So if you want some money-saving six packs, I get that. But look for certain plants because others, like the marigolds, like the ageratum, you know, some of the ones that are in six packs do need to be deadheaded. 
If you are planting dahlias, stake the tall ones or use large tomato cages. Put that stake in when you put the tuber in the ground because that saves you time because then as the plant grows, it is a simple matter to tie a string around it every now and then. And you don't have to worry about propping it up or the fact that it's blown over in the storm or the rain made the flowers too heavy and they've blown over already. And then you've got to cobble something together. Preventing a plant from blowing over ahead of time saves you time later. So let's look at a little mid-March information, little insider information for you. And then I'll come back and I'll answer your questions that are in chat. So whatever questions you have, type them in chat anytime now, and I'll take them from top to bottom until six o'clock. First of all, it's not too early for the bulbs. Some people are worried, oh, I see my daffodils are making flowers already. I think they're confused, it's too early. I'm here to tell you to trust your plants. Trust your plants. You know, plants are operating all on soil temperature at this time of year. They know what time of year it is, right? Because the soil temperature is telling them. And when it comes to daffodils, that soil temperature is telling them to start to come up. That soil temperature is too cold for the perennial hibiscus. You don't see that coming up right now, right? because it's getting its information that it's too cold for it to come up. But for some plants, the soil is saying, all right, start to grow. Daffodils as one of the plants, trust them. They know what they're doing. Now, the roses are starting to bud out. This is my rose today. Look at that. See those red buds? When you see those red buds on the rose, you can start to prune your roses. And what you wanna do is take off anything that's dead. This is a branch right here that's completely dead. I'm gonna cut that out. There's a, that branch back here is completely dead. I'm gonna cut that out. I will trim back some of these. And when it comes to a rose, I will trim them right above one of the red buds that facing away oh, from the center of the plant. See my cursor here? That red bud is facing away from the center. So if I clip that there, then this branch is gonna go in this direction, which is gonna make a nice shaped rose bush, all right? So wherever you make your cut, make it above an outward facing red bud, and you're gonna be in great visual shape with your roses. At Hyannis Country Garden, we have onion sets in. If you plant onions with sets, come on in. We've got reds, we've got yellows, we've got shallots, um, we've got, of course, and you see in the background here, we've got all kinds of summer bulbs, the lilies and the dahlias. If you're a dahlia lover like I am, come in early so that you have your best choice. And there are hellebores on the patio. They are so pretty, all right? These are the Lenten rose. They normally bloom in, at this time of year. Out in the landscape, my Lenten roses are not quite in flower yet. They come in flower late March, April, and May. I still have Christmas roses um, in bloom in my yard. Uh, so those hellebores are still in flower. If you have a combination of the Christmas rose and the Lenten rose, you will have something in flower in your gardens 12 months of the year, right? You can have flowers 12 months of the year here on Cape Cod and aren't those pretty. And these make nice cut flowers too. So don't be afraid to cut them. And look what we've got. We've got bulbs in pots. So for those people who missed the chance to plant fall bulbs and they want some tulips or they want some hyacinths, you can get them in pots. This is just the beginning of the flood of bulbs in pots. Um, so know that you know we, they continue to flood in and you know what's coming in next week, the pansies. So we've got, you know, spring flowers that can make you happy either by planting them outside right now or by making a spring display on your kitchen counter or in the middle of your kitchen um, table. And here's another little hint. If you're buying primroses, the yellow ones are very fragrant. So be sure to include a yellow primrose in your kitchen spring flower display because you will love the fragrance. 
All right, so I hope you'll keep in touch. I'm gonna come into chat, but here, this is my email. If you wanna shoot a picture of that with your phone or take a screenshot, um, see Alfinari at countrygarden.com. Our website is of course, hyannascountrygarden.com. On the events page there are all the events that are coming up and we have a lot of them this spring. So um, looking forward to seeing you at some of the events. Now let's stop the share here. There we go. I'm back in the nursery and I'm gonna open chat and start answering questions from top to bottom. All right, uh, okay, here we go. Um, okay, oh, people from Plymouth, Chicago. Hey, Larry and Maria, good to see you. Hope to see you on Cape soon. Okay, and oh, also great people with great drinks in hand. You're making me thirsty. All right, now, ooh, dry Bombay martini. That sounds luscious. Okay, <laughs> uh, I'm getting to the questions. Hold on, I'm just making sure that um, I am not skipping something. Can Montauk cuttings be put directly in the ground now if or root in water when you can you plant outside? Um, Montauk daisies are really easy to root, okay? You can, after you take a cutting of a Montauk, you can put it right in a, a pot of potting mix and it will root right in there. You can root it in water and then pot it up. You can't stick them right in the ground at this time of year and have them root. If it's already rooted, you could probably plant it if the buds have not are, are not more accelerated than the ones that are in the landscape. If the buds are more accelerated than the ones that are in the landscape, I would pot that Montauk cutting up in a pot, put it outside during the day and bring it in at night and then plant it out sometime in April just to get it used to it. All right. Okay, I'm glad you like those rabbit. Uh, rabbits eat hostas. Yes, they do. Um, but they don't eat geranium macrorhizum or the epimedium that I showed you. So there are two that the bunnies do not touch. And if you get yourself some plant skid, um, I will type it in chat for everybody here. The name liquid plant skid, L-I-Q-U-I-D, P-L-A-N-T-S-K-Y-D-D. -S -D. It means animal repellent in another um, language. So if you plant that um, in, uh, I, I mean, if you take the plant skid, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm losing my train of thought. If you take the plant skid and sprays a hosta just as it's coming up, or those daylilies just as they're coming up, the rabbits will leave them alone and you usually don't have to do it again. Be the whole key with animal control is not letting them get in the habit of eating on a particular plant. Because once they're in the habit, they're gonna come back there for dinner. You know, they've got standing reservations in your, your shade garden. And so you don't, you wanna tell them there are no reservations to be had uh, where those hostas are growing, that you are fully committed, as they say in the restaurant business. And you do that with liquid plant skid, you spray it on when the plants are first coming up or the very first time you put a plant in your garden. When I am planting a new ornamental perennial or shrub, I don't go to bed that night or annual, I don't go to bed that night until I spray it with plant skid because I want the bunnies to know this is not on their menu. You use small branches broken off for staking uh, with that clematis. Yes, that is great. You know, and and at this time of year, if you're pruning your red twig dogwood and cutting off the stems down near the ground, which is the way to prune a red twig dogwood is you cut the older stems down near the ground. Those make great plant supports. So don't just toss them in the brush pile, save those because um, they, you know, they are good. <laughs> Maggie, thank you. She said, I'm hilarious. Thank you. Uh, we, we, we aim to be factual <laughs> as well as fun. Uh, at, uh, at these happy hours. So I tried to grow hollyhocks only green growth for years. Zach, I'm so sorry. It's heartbreaking, isn't it? Um, I have had flowers on hollyhocks, but they also almost immediately get rust by midsummer. And, and it's because of our damp air. 
and it just, you know, I kind of gave up on them. So they are gorgeous. I remember them from my childhood. My grandmother, who lived in the very dry climate of Colorado Springs, um, grew them. And uh, so that was good. You're going to suggest some desirables. I think that you were probably referring to um, perennials, yes. And um, I do have perennial programs coming up, number one. Number two, when I do walk and talks in the nursery, I tell you about all the low maintenance plants. Um, so, and um, number three, if you uh, want some suggestions, email me. Email me at Hyannis Country Garden. I'll shoot you off a list of names of plants that are carefree, that you don't have to touch from the moment they come up in your perennial garden until you clean them up the following spring. What are your predictions for hydrangea macrophylla this year? Oh, the mop heads and the lace caps. I have my fingers crossed. So far, I think it's going to be a good year. I am still seeing buds that are green on my hydrangeas, including my neighbor's hydrangea, which is not at all bud hardy. He's got a big daddy and it's not a bud hardy variety. So if if we're in any hydrangea danger, uh, that big daddy, it bites the dust right away. And the buds on that are still green. So I'm very hopeful. And let's just hope, let's just hope that um, the April, is not drastically cold because what could do us in at this point, as we're going through March and we're in good shape, right? But what could do us in is if we have a sudden plunge into the 20s in April. So fingers crossed. These cultivars such as Jacob Climanarda, does it support local pollinators even though it's not the same straight species? Jacob Klein is a nature made plant not a human developed cultivar, okay? People don't understand that many named varieties, nature developed these <laughs> and they were seen by humans uh, like um, Iron Butterfly Vernonia and Jacob Klein Monarda. Jacob Klein was discovered uh, in Georgia. Nature made this plant. And yes, it supports pollinators as much as the straight species. So um, people have unfortunately gotten the idea that any named variety does not support pollinators. And it is not true. Any named variety that nature came up with is uh, not sterile and is usually quite supportive. And even ones that people came up with, I have to, I have to refer you to the Mount Cuba uh, botanic garden in Delaware where they do native trials all the time and they trial things to make sure that they are good for pollinators and a lot of the human developed cultivars are win the day for pollinator support. So look to the research a little bit on this. When you say pack the perennials in, do you mean planting them closer than the tags suggest? Um, it kind of depends on the perennial because yes, it can mean planting them closer than the tags suggest. It, it also depends on the tag. Sometimes these tags are accurate and sometimes they're not, you know? Um, so, and a tag often does not give you an idea if a plant spreads quickly. So the tags on that Jacob Climanarda are not likely to say, you know, doubles its width in one year or, you know, or spreads quickly in the garden. And um, so for plants that do have a reputation of spreading fairly quickly, you don't have to put them closer. Um, but there are some plants like Stokes asters, they don't spread much at all. Peonies, they get a little bigger, but they don't spread like, you know, some other plants do. And so um, what I would do is plant them and over the course of two years, see whether they're spreading or not. And if they're not, you can plant a couple of more and pack them in closer to keep the, the weeds out. And I, I like that question. Thank you, Karen. Uh, if you start seeds, uh, large pots of seed starting mix, does that inhibit the ability of the roots to strengthen if they're not put into soil? 
seed starting mix supports um, plant young plants for a good two months. I think that's your question, right? Uh, and so uh, just don't pack the seedlings in together. You want one seedling per pot uh, in seed starting mix. You can also start seeds in regular potting mix if you want. The pieces are a little bit bigger, but usually that is not a problem. But seed starting mix, you can depend on that to support the, the seedling for at least two months before you get it into the garden. So, um, and that's without fertilizing, okay? Curious if you have done any winter sowing. I don't do winter sowing because it's more time consuming. <laughs> because this is the thing about winter sowing. People put out a milk jug or a container with mix and then the seeds and they put it outside. And yes, at a certain point, depending on the temperature of the soil, because seeds germinate strictly in response to temperature of soil, at a certain point, they will all start to sprout. But then you've got all these seedlings in a container that need to be transplanted and fairly quickly. And the reason I say fairly quickly is that seeds, seedlings protect their own. Plants protect their own. They look after their own kin. So if you've got a bunch of let's say, oh, I don't know, Rebecca seeds in a milk jug or in a container that you've wintered sowed and they've all sprouted, you need to separate them fairly quickly because not only do their roots intertangle and then when you pull them apart, you damage the roots, but also when their roots are intertangled, they moderate their growth because they don't want to outgrow their cousin next to them and their brother on the other side and so you don't get plants that are as big when they're all grown in one container like that as you do if they're grown in single containers. And later in the spring, that's when I have the least amount of time. Yeah, you can plant them now, but so what? They're gonna be much more time consuming in the spring than if you had waited and put uh, individual seeds in individual pots, and then you have the luxury of waiting until you can put it in the garden, whether that takes you a week or two weeks or even three weeks, you know, the plant is growing in its own pot and it's not going to be stunted in growth and it's not tangling up its roots with its, with its uh, uh, relatives. So, so I don't winter sow because it's, it takes more time uh, to do that. So I think it's kind of become a little bit of a internet, uh, a social media promoted bad, shall I say? So um, anyway, can you plant caladiums early? No, caladiums want it hot. Um, they don't sprout until the weather is hot. And and I'll tell you my caladium story. The first time I did caladiums, I, I put them early in pots indoors. They did not sprout. They did not sprout in April. They did not sprout in May. I then put them outside in June and they did not sprout. I finally decided that they were duds. I threw them in the compost pile. The heat of the compost pile triggered them to sprout and then I could put them back in the garden. But when I said this to um, a friend of mine, uh, the late Gordon Gaskell, um, he told me that he used to work in uh, big estate greenhouses here on the Cape. And what they would do to start the caladiums is they would put the flats on top of the steam pipes that heated the greenhouse. Even a seed starting heat mat is not really warm enough for caladiums. So you need to get them warm. Now, if you've got the top of a refrigerator that's really warm or something like that, you might be able to do it. All right, um, Nancy, thank you. Uh, let's see, uh, let's see. Oh, the shovels. Everybody's loving their spearhead shovel. I love that, that you love them too. It is a great time saving tool. If waiting to do garden cleanup until the end of May to allow beneficial insects to thrive, how can I how can I mulch? Well, see, I don't wait. I think this whole thing of waiting until the end of May ignores several things. First of all, it ignores the fact that um, you can't give an arbitrary end of May deadline or a 50 degree deadline uh, because some insects are out way before that. That's number one, okay? 
Number two, the majority of insects are not overwintering in our cultivated gardens. They're overwintering in wilder places. That's the reason to have a wilder place on your property. If you wanna help support that insect population, do that. Number three, if you do wanna wait till the end of May to clear up your garden, know that you will be weeding at the same time as clearing up the garden because the weeds will have germinated. And you decide, you know, what you wanna do. I think that the cleanup process does not have to be all or nothing um, in terms of insects. And I think that everybody needs places on their property where they are letting nature have a little more of the say as to what's going on there, where they're letting nature mulch. You know, nature has the woods well mulched right now with all the leaves that have fallen down. So, <laughs> so nature isn't worried about, you know, the, those, the insects are under those leaves and fine. Uh, so anyway, um, I think you can, you can clean up certain beds or mulch in the beds that you have traditionally had the worst weed problem and leave other areas until later and leave other areas where it's a little more of a wild um, thing going on and you can you know, uh, have those to support the pollinators. How to deal with rabbits. Um, I mentioned plant skid, uh, and I mentioned spraying something as soon as you plant it, all right? That's the way to deal with rabbits. And in terms of vegetables, you fence the garden. Uh, you can't spray the plant skid or any of the other rabbit repellents. I wouldn't spray them on vegetables because they're all either egg, milk, or blood-based, and you don't want those on your vegetables, okay? So can I prune my Montauk daisy and how much should I prune? And I think, well, we might have time for one other question, but after that, if you haven't had your question answered, I will save the chat and I will um, then answer these on Hyannis Country Gardens blog next week, I promise. Okay, Montauk daisies, you wanna prune them? Yes, you wanna take off the dead tips, but that's all you wanna prune them. The more you prune a Montauk daisy back, the more it pushes new growth the next year, which is weaker growth, the more prone they are to flopping. Um, Montauk daisies are best treated like a shrub. And so you would cut off anything dead in the spring and you can see when their green buds start to swell and the tips may have no green buds, so cut those tips off. And that's all you do to a Montauk daisy. And you wanna grow Montauks in full sun on a lean diet not much water, not much fertilizer, right? Just a, a nice lean diet and they will stay upright and be beautiful for you. And no, you don't need to shear them. If you shear them later in the summer, it not only delays the bloom for a couple of weeks, but they get more top heavy and are again, more prone to flopping. All right, I have a mature but somewhat leggy rhododendron. What would you recommend to try and make it fuller? Well, you could, uh, when the new growth comes out this year, you could pinch the very tip of the new growth, which will double the growth right below where you pinched. It is not, however, going to stimulate growth down below. If you have a leggy rhododendron where you see the bottoms, I would start to think of this as a multi-stemmed small tree that has character. <laughs> and what I would do is then plant a nice shade planting underneath of epimedium and hosta and maybe some variegated carex or that looks like uh, grass so that you don't have to mulch under there and you've got plants growing under there, maybe a few astilbes for bloom in July, and you'd let the rhododendron have its bare ankles because the only thing that might stimulate growth down below is if you cut one of those stems off down below. But the problem is if it's got a lot of growth up on top, it's still not gonna shoot up growth underneath because there's not enough sunlight there and plants don't make leaves where no photosynthesis can happen. So if I were you, I would start to think of it as a multi-stemmed small tree and you know maybe limit up a little. If you wanted, you could even plant some other shrubs in front of it, some azaleas or something in front of it uh, and you know 
go go for it that way. Some some rhododendrons are more prone to having bare legs and ankles than others. And so, and for those plants, you need to give it socks and shoes. All right. Well, it has been great being with you tonight. I am saving the chat so I can answer all the questions we didn't get to. Look at the blog at hyannascountrygarden.com um, either on Monday, should, should be up there by Monday, and you will read the answers to your questions there. Uh, it's been fun to be with you. We've got another happy hour coming up next month and most months we have one going on so i hope that you'll join me again in the meantime i wish you all an early spring and some sunny days <laughs> thanks a lot see you soon <laughs>